think we're ready to begin. <laughs> if we're doing this right, it should be about 12.15. How are we doing? Those that have been to the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series before understand that we do try to run a very, very disciplined program. That's just one of the things that makes this gathering unique. We do intend to end at uh, 1.30. First, let me begin on behalf of Mickey Ibarra and Associates. I am pleased to welcome you to our first Latino Leaders Luncheon Series event for 2006, featuring the newest member of the United States Senate, Senator Robert Menendez. This is the fifth luncheon of the series that we actually began in 2004 in Boston. But for anyone here attending for the very first time, by the way, I'd be interested. How many are here for the first time? Would you please raise your hand? Very good. Very good. Just a, a brief background. The Latino Leaders Luncheon Series is intended to provide us an opportunity to come together quarterly in our nation's capital to share our personal stories, viewpoints, and yes, to celebrate our successes together. Something that I don't think we do nearly often enough. It is also an opportunity for us to get to know each other better and for our featured speaker to get, uh, to, get to know us better as well. This event and the three remaining for 2006 are made possible, possible by Verizon Communications and the Coca-Cola Company. And we are grateful for their long-standing, long-standing support of the Latino community. Please acknowledge our sponsors. In addition, today's reception held right here in the state room was sponsored by Harris Entertainment. And I would like to thank two of their representatives who are here today, Tony Gladney, Vice President of National Diversity Relations, and also the newest member of the Harris Diversity Team, Tony Diazlan, National Diversity Manager. I'd like both Tonys to please stand up. <laughs> This morning, we conducted our first issue hour at 10 a.m. This is a, a new feature of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series that we'd ask you to consider in the future. The idea is together for a single hour in advance of our luncheon to talk about an issue of critical importance to the Latino community. I want to thank our participants who attended at 10 a.m., we had uh, Maldef represented, we had LULAC represented, Mi Familia Vota also participated in the issue hour, and you can expect those to continue. Before we hear from our sponsors, uh, let me recognize a few of our special guests, but with this understanding, everyone in this room, everyone, believe me, is a special guest that you wouldn't be here. But I think you agree that one of the important aspects of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series is to get to know each other better. Some assumptions that we have is that we all know each other. I don't think that's true. But my hope is, is that this Latino Leaders Luncheon Series will help us to get to know each other better. We have several members of Congress. The way I'd like to do this, to make it just a bit briefer, if you'd permit me, is to do this in several different groups. I'd like to mention their names and then ask them to stand and to be acknowledged by all of us here at lunch. First, uh, Congressman Joe Baca of California, Congressman Bill, Bob Filner, rather, of California, and also Congressman Michael Honda of California, if they would stand. Thank you. I, I'll tell you what, I want to uh, 
acknowledge Congressman Baca and his wonderful Chief of Staff, Linda Macias. Those of us in this room that have served in a staff capacity for our entire careers understand how important staff work is. And Linda does it very, very well. But I want to specifically thank Congressman Baca. I'll tell you, like all of you, I attend many, many events. And there are a few Latino gatherings where I don't see Congressman Baca. And I think it is a great tribute to him that he is here again today. And thank you, Congressman. We also have members of the administration that we are very proud to invite and delighted that they have responded and are here with us. And again, I'll read the names and I'll ask you to stand and be acknowledged. Roel Campos from the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, Adolfo Franco, the Assistant Administrator of the Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean at USAID, Ernesto Garcia, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Selective Service System, Francis Garcia, the Inspector General at the Government Accounting Office. We also have Sergio Rodriguez, the Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Treasury. And finally, Roberto Salazar, an Administrator at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. With the administration members, and if I've missed anybody, please forgive me and please stand and be acknowledged. We have a few Hispanic organizations in the room also. And like all of you, I'm very, very proud of the work that they do each and every day here in Washington and across our country to advocate for our community in so many levels and representing our Hispanic organizations in the room. Again, I'll read through the names, ask you to stand and be acknowledged. Esther Aguilera, who will be in our program in a moment, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Michael Barrera, uh, President and CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Michael. Eduardo Batilla, Executive Director of the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration. I saw him earlier. Yes, there, there you go. Ron Blackburn Moreno, President of ASPIRA, but also Chair of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, Ron. We also have my friend Liz Burgos, Executive Director of NHCSL with us. Cristina Caballero is also with the Dialogue on Diversity. I thought that I saw Cristina earlier. Janita Cruz of the National Hispanic Council on Aging. Uh, Rolanda Esparza, Chief Operating Officer of the American GI Forum. We also have Hector Flores, the President of LULAC. He may not have arrived yet, but I, I know that we have Brent Wilkes from LULAC that is here. Octavio Hinojosa, the Executive Director of the Congressional uh, Hispanic Leadership Institute, is with us. Mario Lopez, the Executive Director of the Congressional Hispanic Conference. Regina Montoya, CEO, New America Alliance. And Jorge Musuli, the Executive Director of Mi Familia Vota. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for being here with us. And I've just flipped the page and we have more. But you know what? Before I forget, I, I want Regina Montoya to stand up for just one more second. Regina, when we last gathered on November 2nd with Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, we provided Regina with an opportunity to address this, as we do with each of these events, a nonprofit organization, to talk with us about what they're accomplishing to develop the next generation of leaders that will fill this room into the future. Regina did a wonderful job, and I just wanted to report a major accomplishment since our last meeting, and that is the announcement I believe just made yesterday by Washington Mutual of her nomination to serve on their board of directors.
fact, uh, where's Peter Villegas of Washington Mutual? He's in the house too. Peter? I, uh, I hope you agree that we ought to be as vigorous in our praise as we are in our criticism for our corporations or really anyone else uh, in our country. And we're delighted that Washington Mutual has done the right thing and encourage others to do the same. Additional leaders in our community that are here, again, that we're so proud to have, Alex Nogales, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition. <laughs> Tom Oliver, the CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Publications, Tom. <laughs> Angela Ramirez, the Executive Director of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. This is a new assignment for Angela. We're going to be hearing a lot from her. And we have also Alma Riojas, the president of MANA, who is here with us. <laughs> Lillian Rodriguez Lopez, the president of the Hispanic Federation, is with us as well. We also have Milton Rosado, the national president of LACLA. Jose Antonio Tierino, the President and CEO of the Hispanic uh, Heritage Foundation, is also here. And of course, Arturo Vargas, the longtime Executive Director of Naleo, is here. And finally, Al Zapanta, President of the U.S. Mexico Chamber of Commerce. And again, thanks to our leadership for joining us. We have a few special guests also from the local and state elected official category. That's my favorite. We have the Secretary of State of New Mexico, Rebecca Vigil Heron, who is joining us. We also have a dear friend, Supervisor Mary Rose Wilcox of Maricopa County, Arizona, with us. and Councilman Tom Perez of Montgomery County, Maryland. Tom? A final category and an important category, one that touches me personally. I think many of you uh, have heard my personal story, and, and it begins with my father, Francisco Nicolás Santiago Ibarra who came to this country in 1945 as a bracero, Spanish Fork, Utah. Imagine that. And we have the distinction of being joined today by the ambassador of Mexico, His, Excellency, His Excellency Carlos Alberto de Icaza. We also are joined by Juan Carlos Iturregui, who is the president for the Foundation for Inter-American Development. <laughs> Lily Eskelson, the secretary treasurer of the National Education Association. <laughs> a friend that you're going to be hearing a lot more about uh, as it relates to the standing up of a Hispanic Strategy Center, the president and founder of NDN, Simon Rosenberg. <laughs> and also the vice president of the National Education Association, Dennis Van Roekel. Dennis. <laughs> That's a who's who. And again... I want to thank all of you for being here. You're all very important to us. We're delighted that you're here. We hope that we see you again at our very next Latino Leaders Luncheon. I mentioned that this is all made possible by the generous contribution of two important corporations, the Coca-Cola Company and Verizon. Each have a position on our program to offer sponsor remarks. Representing the Coca-Cola Company today is Frank Ross, the Assistant Vice President for Latin Affairs, a terrific champion for our community. We'd like to hear 
some remarks from Frank. Frank? Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Es un gran placer estar aquí con ustedes. And now I'll switch to my southern accent. <laughs> I was telling somebody a funny story, and I won't take it a second. But obviously, I, when I speak, this southern accent comes out, and it blows people's mind. But I immigrated here in 1964 on a ship through New York Harbor, but we ended up in Greenville, South Carolina, which was a tech stock capital of the world, as you can imagine. Uh, first Latino family into a meal town. But uh, it really has worked out well as I work with state legislators in Georgia and, and other areas in the south. But one day I happened to run into one of the legislators, I might name who it is, and we were talking, he found out I was Spanish. He goes, but do you speak Spanish with a southern accent? <laughs> and I wasn't going to be a smart aleck, but I said, yeah, I'm from southern Spain. <laughs> then it hit me that he believed me. <laughs> and so I had to find a polite way to explain to him that, I'm actually from Barcelona, which is in northeast Spain, and that people in Spain, especially in the southern part of Spain, do not have southern accents. So <laughs> it was entertaining. We became good friends after that. But at first, I, was, I found myself in a pickle trying to explain to this guy there's not such a thing as southern Spanish. <laughs> but seriously, on behalf of our chairman, Neville Isdale, and the 50,000-plus Coca-Cola associates worldwide, I'd like to thank you for being here today. It truly is an honor to sponsor an event that brings so many quality individuals together. And I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor, Verizon Representative Magda Irizadi, which I saw her a minute ago. There she is, for joining us. It's been a great journey with Mickey. Uh, what he has created with the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series is an event that brings together individuals willing to make a difference while allowing knowledgeable and dynamic individuals like Senator Menendez to address important issues. Like you, I look forward to hearing Senator Tobias Menendez speak today. I've had the privilege of getting to know him, and he is a wonderful person. He is a man of impeccable values and, and, and ethics, and is a great representative of not just the Hispanic community, but of our country. The Coca Cola Company has a long history of giving back to communities which we serve. It is part of a thread that makes up the overall fa fabric of our business. As a result, it is a great sense of pride for our employees to be associated with a company that has done more to help more communities and more people in more places around the world than probably any other company in the history of, of corporate America. We look forward to continuing to work with you and other business leaders, both in the public and private sector, to strengthen the Latino community. Besides being the right thing to do, we recognize that a strong Hispanic community means a stronger America. With that, I'd like to say thank you, and we hope you enjoy the luncheon. We are now joined by the newest member of the United States Senate, the Honorable Robert Menendez. Senator, we're delighted to have you here with us. We've heard from the Coca-Cola Company, our co-sponsor. We are also very grateful for the support of Verizon Communications, another great friend of the Hispanic community. With us to deliver sponsor remarks is Magda Irizarri, Verizon Vice President for Workplace Culture, Diversity, and Compliance. Magda?
can't top that accent story, Frank. That was just outstanding because I had the same reaction when I met Frank. I said, I want to hear him speak Spanish. <laughs> but it's an honor. I want to thank everyone. It's so wonderful to be in a room with so many distinguished guests. I mean, the who's who is in the house, and I am so honored to be here as part of this luncheon. I thank Mickey and everyone involved in organizing it, Coca-Cola for their continued partnership, my colleagues at Verizon for deferring and allowing me this privilege. It's a, it's a unique privilege because when Coca-Cola and I were together in Boston the last time at a similar luncheon, our distinguished senator was then a congressman, and my daughter was in the audience, and she wanted today off. But she couldn't come, so we'll have to set up another time. But how wonderful to have heard you speak then and to we anticipate hearing you speak today. And it's wonderful in the context of leadership that's represented uh, in this room where so many people started in so many different places and today are continuing a legacy. And the legacy of Senator Menendez started even when he was in college and served as a school board uh, member, and it reminds me of the many aspirantes. How many in this room are aspirantes? We do this all the time, not that many? Certainly Ron. But we talk, we talk. <laughs> the champion aspirante and my baby Sadi, okay? But we talk to our young people about leadership starting right now. We, we think about ourselves in this moment in time and have to ask ourselves, what can I do today? What can I do now? And that's the kind of leadership embodied in this room and certainly modeled by the congressman when he began to serve even as a college student and now today in the Senate. We have many issues in common, issues of dedication to affordability for health care and higher education, and the years of service that the senator as a congressman and in his leadership have always dedicated to those issues. We care deeply at Verizon because we understand that the workforce of the future is about opportunity in education and certainly about health care, and that also not only is it an issue for the workforce, but it's about the quality of life and the attainment of the American dream. And so we're critically committed to both issues and are really proud that they're in alignment with some of the fine work of the senator. We've also been able to share in work around access to technology and the power of technology to change lives, to impact business, commerce, education, health care, and certainly the lives of people in their very home. And certainly we see that, that there's a lot of growth and change in this industry, and we remain a vital part of it, and we thank the senator for the years that he's been involved in making sure that that is also accessible and affordable for all Americans. We represent at Verizon in the fine state of New Jersey, 15,000 employees and over 2.5 million customers, and we're so honored and pleased to be here to celebrate with you your ascension to the Senate, and to celebrate Latino progress in the United States of America. Thank you. I also want to make sure that we acknowledge a very important guest with us as well from New Jersey, the Attorney General of the State of New Jersey, Sulima Farber. Welcome. We are going to have lunch. <laughs> Trust me. But what I'd like to do is to use our three-minute slot that we give for a nonprofit organization and to do that next, and then we're going to have a blessing on the food, and then lunch will be served. I would like to present Anne Marie Tallman, President of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund for Brief Remarks. Now this spot again is so important and each and every time you can expect one for one of our national organizations, MALDEF such a proud advocate, advocate and effective advocate for our community, specifically to talk about what they're engaged in to build the next generation of leaders that will fill this room and what all of us can do to be supportive. Anne Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Mickey, for hosting the Latino Leaders Luncheon. It is critically important for all of us to gather so that we can recognize not only our accomplishments, but also be sure that we are working in collaboration with one another to strengthen our voice, to solidify behind important issues that impact our community, and to make our presence known in the national policy arena. So, Mickey, I applaud you for hosting these luncheons. I think they're absolutely critical to our leadership. I also want to congratulate Senator uh, Menendez. You have been one of our strongest advocates. You serve not only those in New Jersey, but you serve all Latinos in the United States. I know that's a heavy burden sometimes uh, to shoulder, but we greatly appreciate the strength of your voice you truly do have the interests of our community at heart, and thank you so very much for your leadership. I'd like to acknowledge one of our board members of MALDEF, Peter Villegas with Washington Mutual. Peter is the chairman of our fiscal and fundraising committee and has been very engaged in helping us uh, diversify our funding base and strengthen our financial uh, condition over the last couple of years. Peter, I'd like to acknowledge you again. Two staff members are here uh, with MALDEF who are critically important in leading our organization. And as Nikki put it, uh, is they are the next generation of leaders for MALDEF and will be leading it uh, forward on critical issues of great importance to the Latino community, making sure our legal voice is heard. John Trezvina, who many of you know, uh, is here. He's our Senior Vice President for Law and Policy. Yay. And Shahina Simon, who leads our Washington, D.C. effort, is also with us today. Shahina? There she is back here. Maldives has been busy over the last two years. We have ensured that the Latino community has a national presence on very important issues uh, to our community. We led the effort in uh, making certain that the issues were raised as it related to the confirmation of our Attorney General. We have had a critical role and played a critical role in the judicial nomination process of two United States Supreme Court justices, ensuring that our community's voice was heard and that our issues were placed squarely in the national arena uh, when those nomination processes, processes took place. We've also been very engaged and instrumental in kicking off voting rights reauthorization dialogue and debate across the United States. We must reauthorize Section 5 and Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. We've made sure that our voice has been heard at the state and local level in places like Arizona in legal challenges to Proposition 200, challenging similar initiatives currently in the state of Colorado, legal challenges in Georgia on voter identification requirements that severely impair and impact the ability of our community to exercise their right to vote. And for the first time in nearly two decades, Maldef went to the highest court of the land, the United States Supreme Court, just last week. Our attorney who leads our San Antonio office, Nina Parales, ensured that our voice was heard because voting is a right in the United States. In Perry versus GI Forum versus Perry, Maldef made sure that the Latino voice was heard so that our vote could continue to count, and that was in the Texas redistricting case. We've also worked over the past two years to ensure that we strengthen our coalitions, not only with other civil rights organizations, and I recognize and acknowledge all the great work of many of our civil rights leaders in the audience today, but also working with state and local officials. We've worked with um, Rebecca, thank you so much, 
in your great state, protecting voting rights of Latinos in uh, New Mexico. And we've also spent a significant amount of time uh, working with the supervisor in Arizona on the Arizona challenges. We've also ensured that we've reached out to our African-American brothers and sisters as we all face challenges related to our democracy and our voice and our right to vote under the voting rights reauthorization work. Finally, we have ensured that our organization is an organization that is built to last. We've worked tirelessly to diversify Maldives' funding base, which we've achieved. We've ensured that debt on our Los Angeles building, and everybody knows how hard capital campaigns are, uh, was actually forgiven under a service repayment arrangement with the city of Los Angeles. And we've also made certain that we've improved our infrastructure so that our lawyers can take on the biggest challenges and ensure that the litigation that MALDEF leads will make make certain that our community is protected in the voting voting rights, immigration rights, labor rights, employment rights, um, and uh, all of those civil right protections are uh, continuing to occur nationally and at the state and local level. As many of you may have heard, um, I have decided to transition um, out of MALDEF. Um, I am leading the transition uh, at the organization. Uh, I have dedicated uh, 19 years of service to MALDEF. I started as a law student, uh, identifying uh, litigation opportunities for the attorneys in our then San Francisco office. I served on the board of directors for MALDEF for over seven years. And I have led the organization over the last two years, bringing my business experience and expertise, as well as my commitment to justice under the law to the organization. Uh, we've uh, had a good two-year run. We've ensured the organization is in great shape. The transition will be seamless. And I'm very much looking forward to continuing my work, not only with MALDEF, but with many of our civil rights organizations, supporting our congressional and Senate leaders as they continue to work on the toughest challenges facing our community and providing a real voice. I've enjoyed this service very much. I've enjoyed the support and work with all of you. And I look forward to working with you uh, on many challenges and opportunities in the future. Thank you very much. of your leadership and your service. Thank you so much. And now, our longtime friend, former Congressman Bobby Garcia, will offer a blessing on our food, after which lunch will be served, and then we'll reserve, reserve our program with an introduction and remarks from Senator Menendez. Bobby? Mickey, I know that so many people are going to congratulate you and tell you but I just have to get 15 seconds in. When I first got here back in 1978, to think that I would ever see a room full of so many leaders, we couldn't dream of this, Mickey. And I, and I say this, <laughs> and I say this as a person who was elected under the original Voting Rights Act back in 1965. <laughs> But now I have a better calling. I have a calling because Mickey has asked me to take us all before the Lord. But at the table you're sitting right now, I would ask that each and every one of you look at each other and know each other. This is just not a, a dinner, a luncheon. This is a gathering of people who are working for a community. Thank God for what he's been able to do for us, and thank God for what he's been able to do for 
for you and you. And I look at Hernandez because he was back there in 78 with me. But anyway, let's bow our heads. Lord, we do thank you for this time together. We thank you for this food that we're about to eat. We thank you for your presence in this room, my Father. We thank you because you are who you are. You're the king. You're the king of kings and the lord of lords. And no matter how high we get, my Father, you're always above us. And we thank you for that assurance. We thank you for the Hispanic community. We thank you for our senator. And not only him, but the other two senators that serve with him, my Father. What a privilege to have three of our own in the United States Senate. Oh, my Father, we thank you for what you've been able to do. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you, my Father, that we have all come to know you. And in your name we all say, Amen. Lunch will now be served. Thank you. I remember well her service with now Governor Bill Richardson uh, when he was the Secretary of Energy. She was appointed President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute in January of 2006. Before I call her to the podium, though, I want to just take a moment to recognize the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute fellows that are in the room. I'd like them to please stand and, and be recognized. <laughs> Janet and the CHCI have been kind enough to to provide a fellow Christian Sanchez at Mickey Ibarra and Associates. It's been a great experience, and again, I think all of us, all of us in this room, and in some small and in some significant ways, have a responsibility to do all that we can to develop and mentor others. Again, Esther Aguilera, a wonderful friend, a person that has so much energy and passion, will introduce our keynote speaker. Esther. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you for your leadership, for bringing us together. Congratulations on five years of success. And thank you for supporting Latinas, because I know during these wonderful luncheon series and sessions, he always showcases um, women. And he does that because <laughs> otherwise he does it on his own accord. He's amazing. <laughs> but. We have talked about leadership development, which is near and dear to my heart and our mission at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. This is an organization that's rich with history and um, so much accomplishments, thanks to so many people who were there, like Bob Garcia, our congressman who helped spearhead and, and launch so much of what we do today to some of my congressional board members that are here, Congressman Baca, uh, Senator Menendez, and many others who have made the Institute what it is today. And we're committed and our mission is focused on developing the next generation of Latino leaders. And this year, we celebrate our 25th anniversary of our nationally acclaimed public policy fellowship program and our 20th year of our internship program. These are the most prestigious Latino leadership programs we have. We're very proud of them. In fact, as Mickey mentioned, some of our current fellows are here and some of our alumni. I'm just going to mention that because these are our future leaders. Um, one of our, alum our current fellows, uh, Yasmita, is in the office of Senator Menendez. Um, and future permanent staff, Yasmita, is there. And with us, uh, Christian Sanchez with Mickey Ibarra, Adam Gonzalez, if you guys can stand up, Omar Castaneda, Gabby Ventura, Cristiana Marquez. These, they come from New Mexico, California, Illinois, um, all over the map, Florida. Some of our alumni, Carmen Jorge, who's on, on our current staff, uh, Jeff Cruz from Illinois, Enrique Cortez from Texas, Kenny Reyes from New Jersey. This is a network uh, that we're very proud of. But um, this is, uh, and we have many friends and partners here today 
that help make our work possible, including Coca-Cola, Verizon, and so many others. But it is my distinct honor to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker for lunch, our newest senator, the Honorable Bob Menendez. He has been a board member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute since he was elected to the House of Representatives and has helped us achieve our mission. But from his upbringing as a son of Cuban immigrants to the time he won his first elective office as member of the Union City Board of Education in 1974, and he did this while he was still in college, he has demonstrated passion. From his service as mayor of Union City, New Jersey, while simultaneously serving in the New Jersey State Senate General Assembly between 86 and 92, to the time that he became the first Hispanic to serve in the New Jersey legislature, he has demonstrated drive. How you served two elective offices simultaneously. It's amazing, this individual uh, who we're so proud of. And in 1992, he was sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives, becoming the first Hispanic from New Jersey, elected to a non-majority Latino district, but championing Latino causes. He has demonstrated his commitment and never forgetting where he came from. During, the tenure, during his tenure in the House of Representatives, he became chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. As such, he became the highest ranking Hispanic in congressional history, ladies and gentlemen. A true trailblazer. And as you know, he's our newest senator from New Jersey, only one of three. He currently serves on the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, Banking and Energy, Natural Resources Senate subcommittees. Uh, we are proud of his accomplishments, service, dedication to the betterment of the Latino community, to his beloved state of New Jersey, and to the nation. It has been an honor and pleasure for me to have worked with and know Senator Menendez for over a dozen years. Um, a true unifier, leader, role model for us all. He's known as the junior senator from New Jersey, but there's nothing junior about him. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Bob Menendez. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Hester, por esa introducción. Le agradezco infinitamente que lo dijiste exactamente como te lo escribí. Así que, no, le agradezco sinceramente esa introducción tan amable. Y para mí es un placer estar aquí con este almuerzo de líderes latinos de la nación, con todo lo que vale y brilla en nuestra comunidad. Eh, y como dijo Babi García, qué increíble, qué pasos hemos dado en tan corto tiempo. Y lo que vamos a dar adelante en los días que nos queda. Así que, la tía. For the few friends who are here who might be terrorized, I might continue in Spanish. Let me, uh, this is a Latino leader's luncheon, so uh, let me, uh, let me uh, say that I am really pleased to be here once again. I want to recognize the distinguished, and uh, one uses that term loosely, but in this case, uh, the reality is he is a distinguished 
ambassador of Mexico, who I think does a fantastic job in a very difficult time in creating strong bonds between Mexico and the United States. Ambassador, it's great to have you here at our luncheon. Bobby Garcia, who is now responding to a higher calling, but had a very important calling when he served in the House of Representatives and was a trailblazer for so many people. We always appreciate Bobby Garcia's history and his commitment to people. And Bobby, it was great to have you here. And my dear friend and present member and the chair of BOPAC, which is trying to make sure that more of us serve in the United States Congress, that the Institute's new generation of leaders actually get a shot, and who has done such a fantastic job, Congressman Joe Baca of California. It is always great to be in his presence. And I'll just take the personal privilege of once again recognizing someone who is a very dear friend of mine, someone whose surname might not quite let you understand, but she is the first Hispanic Attorney General in the history of the state of New Jersey. We are incredibly proud of her. Governor Corzine has excellent judgment, as you can see. But Salima Farmer, the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey. Let me congratulate Mickey for not his mini enterprise, his mini kingdom, I should say, that he has created, but more importantly, mini empire, I should say. But more importantly, Mickey has not forgotten where he came from along the way. That is something that I personally admire. Sometimes in our communities, people succeed and then they forget. And I'm not very fond of that. I am fond of remembering where you came from and making sure that there are doors open for others, not doors slammed behind you. And Mickey Ibarra is someone who is constantly opening the doors for people, and he brings us together in common cause for greater goals. Mickey, thank you so much for your vision in creating this lunchroom. Let me thank Frank Ross from Coca-Cola, which I used to consume a lot of, now I have to turn to Diet Coke. But we appreciate his sponsorship here, and Magda Rizzotti, who's just a really fantastic, both of them are fantastic people, but obviously Magda, she is from New Jersey, so I think she is incredibly fantastic for a variety of reasons, some which are very obvious, others which are obvious from her presentation as well, for hosting this latest installment of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. And certainly, it's been a great series. I was privileged to start it off in Boston when we were having the convention there, but then Senator Ken Salazar, my former colleague in the House, his brother John Salazar, the new mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villarregosa. It's great. One of the great cities of the nation is led by an American of Hispanic descent who has a tremendous vision for transforming the opportunity of all the people in that great city, and of course, our Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez. It is a great company to be in, and I'm glad to be back in return engagement in a new title. So let me congratulate everyone who's participated. And I want to just take one other moment before I get to the core of my remarks to recognize Ana Marie Tillman of Maldef. She has done a fantastic job in her advocacy. I am not totally pleased that she is leaving, even though I know she is leaving the organization in good hands. And I know that there was some discussion earlier on immigration. I just believe it is unacceptable here in the nation's capital and throughout our country to depend on the work of so many Latinos for the economy of this country and then turn around and attack our communities and our families for partisan political gain. I personally have never found what is in the vision of those who seek to build walls instead of build bridges of opportunity. 
I don't think that we need a wall between Mexico and the United States. Uh, we need a greater engagement, not only with Mexico, but the rest uh, of the hemisphere. Uh, something that this administration, I, and I, I've criticized previous administrations, so I don't look at it as a partisan remark, but simply has not been engaging in. Uh, and to believe that any fence or any wall will stop the human desire of people to seek opportunity is simply uh, flies in the face of human history. Uh, and it is actually the worst of foreign diplomacy policy I have ever seen uh, us promote. And if we're going to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border, well, we'll have to build a wall upon where people on September 11th came in, and that is in the U.S.-Canada border. So uh, I'm not for either one of them, but let's be honest about the reality. So finally, on that note, we need a smart policy, uh, one that, yes, uh, has every country has the right and the obligation uh, to make sure that it regularizes its border. Uh, and make sure that its border is secure. Uh, by the same token, uh, we need an opportunity uh, to make sure that those who are here in pursuit of the American dream uh, can be brought out of the darkness into the light. Let's make sure who's here to pursue the American dream versus who might be here to destroy it. But overwhelmingly, I believe that people are here in pursuit of that dream. And that means we need not a uh, ticket to deportation, but a pathway to earn legalization in our country. And hopefully the voices of reason will rise up and explain uh, this great reality for our country and move in a different direction than making immigration the wedge issue of 2006. I'll tell you this, for all of us who are citizens, for all of us who are citizens, uh, particularly citizens from the Latino community, and others, because it was interesting, all along Capitol Hill, there was sh people with shirts that said, legalize the Irish. So this is not just uh, a Latino. Very seriously, there are hundreds of people along Capitol Hill with shirts, legalize the Irish. Uh, and in my hometown of Hoboken, New Jersey, the Irish have a long history, and there is a new wave of immigrants uh, from uh, Ireland. This is not, this country is, is not, it has a, a, a proud history of immigration. Uh, and it is that history that has so enriched uh, this country. And while some of us came here involuntarily and others of us came here in search of opportunity and some flew here and others took boats here and others have risked their life to get here, we are all in the same boat together today. And the sooner that we realize that in our community needs to raise their voices because those of us who have achieved uh, the opportunity to fulfill that American dream. Sometimes it's a little upsetting to me uh, that we sit in the luxury of our own circumstances, but if our parents and grandparents and forefathers had had that view, uh, we would not be where we are today. So I hope we will raise our voices along the way. Now, I know this luncheon is a little bit about how some of our leaders achieved what we have achieved, and uh, I think that maybe sharing a little bit, uh, I know so many of you uh, in the audience, uh, but sharing a little bit of my personal history is uh, part of, uh, of who I am today, what I stand for, and what I believe that this nation is, why it's such a, the greatest nation in the world. You know, uh, in my former congressional district and still within sight of where I live, uh, Ellis Island, uh, which was located in uh, the district that I had the honor of representing for over 13 years in the House, has been a gateway to opportunity for millions uh, of Americans. And for me, the island is a shining example of the power of the American dream, a place that launched millions down the road to success in a state that embodies the ideal that children from humble beginnings can grow up to achieve the same dreams as those of families from wealth and fame. Frankly, uh, like many of you in this audience who I know, uh, my story is very close uh, to yours. My uh, parents uh, came to this country in search of freedom. Uh, they came to the greatest country in the world. And what they found is a country uh, where people not only are free to pursue those dreams, but to also have the tools to help realize them. In America, freedom and opportunity are the keys that unlock success not just for the rich or connected, but for anyone who is willing to work hard. 
My mother and father did not have an easy life when they came to this country. Uh, my mother was a uh, seamstress in the factories of New Jersey. My father, when he was alive, was an itinerant carpenter. Uh, we grew up poor uh, in a tenement building in Union City. And what got me involved in, in public life uh, was actually uh, an experience I had when I was in high school in my senior year. I was in a public uh, high school and I was told that because of my grades, I qualified to be in a senior honors program, uh, but that in fact I had to cough up $200 uh, for the books. Uh, my, as I said, my parents were poor. We lived in a tenement and I did not have $200. And I couldn't understand for the life of me why I would be barred from entering into the honors program if I had the capacity but didn't have the money. So I created such a ruckus that they gave me the books, told me to shut up, and put me in the honors program. But, but to be honest with you, I didn't feel right about it because it was okay for me, but it wasn't okay for everybody else who may have not spoken up uh, and exercised what should have been their rights. So the following year, when I graduated uh, from the local public schools and was going to a, a Jesuit uh, college in New Jersey called St. Peter's College, uh, I started a petition drive to change the school board from one that was appointed by a very corrupt administration, hence they wanted my $200 and others, uh, to one that was elected by the public. I spent a long, hot summer at the age of 19 with a group of my friends who felt similarly that they had been cheated of the education they should have received. And we got thousands of signatures on a petition drive to create a public referendum that we succeeded in passing at the age of 19. And then the following year, I ran at the age of 20 for the first school board elections in my hometown that we had created. And I ran against a priest, which in those days were allowed to run for public office. And I won, for which I'm still paying in church today. And that was 32 years ago. Bobby, maybe you can help me. Uh, but uh, it was the beginning of having a sense of standing up for what is right, uh, even though it may be difficult uh, and even though it may not be popular. One of the things I was told, particularly by members of our community, was, ah, pero esto no lo puedes hacer. Eres muy joven, la estructura política nunca te va a permitir cambiarlo, y no se puede. Y le dijimos, pero ustedes están equivocados. Sí, se puede. And we, in fact, uh, not only changed the school board and succeeded in running, and at that time was the youngest person ever elected in the state's history to a school board, but more importantly, we began to transform the school district in its curriculum reform, in its pedagogical approaches, in its diversification of where we got our educators from. And we began to make progress in a school district that today is over 85% Hispanic. All of the children in that school district, 85% of them, come from the Hispanic community. The school district is much better today because we created change uh, uh, so many years ago. And from that lesson, I came to understand that, uh, you know, uh, change doesn't necessarily come easy, uh, and it doesn't come to those who are not willing to commit themselves to an ideal and willing to sacrifice to make that ideal become a reality. And so I then decided to change the city administration uh, and I stood up to a very corrupt city administration. And during this period of time, my life was threatened. I wore a bulletproof vest for two months of my life. Uh, and ultimately, uh, on, uh, in an effort to change the administration, uh, on the day before the election where I led a reform group uh, to uh, ultimately uh, change the city, uh, on the day before the election, the person who I was running in, uh, this mayor, was uh, sentenced to seven years in federal prison. Uh, and I lost the election the next day by 200 votes. The only election I ever lost in 32 years. The only election I intend to ever lose again, by the way. Uh, and the, uh, and I said to myself, well, what did the public think about me, that they wanted to vote for someone who had been sentenced to seven years in federal prison? So I decided actually at that time to go practice law. I had gone to Rutgers Law School and graduated. 
go practice law and decided to use the law as a vehicle to create social change. And what happened was is that the people who followed me in this reform movement, school teachers, custodians, sanitation workers, everyday common people who wanted to see a change in their hometown began to get fired by this administration. And so they ended up on my doorsteps saying, we believed in you, we followed you, and we are now hurt. What are you going to do? And that dragged me back into a process in which we litigated along with a group of my friends who had also become lawyers. By that time, we litigated their cases in state and federal court for wrongful dismission, for violation of civil rights and a whole host of other efforts, and we regained their employment and then four years later became the first Hispanic mayor in the state's history, ousting the rest of what was left of that corrupt administration. And I learned from those early days, whether it is reforming the school district, wearing a bulletproof vest to stand up for what you believe is right, even though it may not be easy and even though it may not be popular, that it has ultimately been my compass point in terms of what I continue to do and have done in the 13 years in the House of Representatives and what I intend to do in the United States Senate. And, you know, that belief drives me to take on a series of challenges that I believe we can head our country in a much better and positive direction. You know, I understand the power of education. You know, I am the first and only member of my family to go to college and to then go to law school. And I understand that it is the key to social mobility and economic opportunity in this country. And the reality is I would not be before you today as a United States senator if I didn't have that educational opportunity. But I also realize that the only way that I could afford St. Peter's College was because of something called Pell and something else called Perkins. And the reality is, but for the government creating an opportunity. You know, we can't guarantee equal outcomes, but we should guarantee equal opportunity. And it became very clear to me then that I would not have had those opportunities. And yet we are faced with a budget today that for the fifth consecutive year freezes Pell grants, which now means that students in our country who mostly get, to the extent that they get assistance, gets it through Pell, can only afford what in essence was at one time 80 percent of the value of a college education was paid by Pell. Today it's about 40 percent paid by Pell. And Perkins, if I didn't have the combination of Pell and Perkins and work through all four years of college, the reality is that Perkins would not have been, if it did not exist, it would have again probably made it impossible for me to go to college. In New Jersey alone that's 15,000 students in which their future will be determined. Largely, most of them coming from our community and the African American community and women in terms of the opportunity to fulfill their God-given potential that they have by virtue of getting this college education. And yet the President's budget eliminates Perkins totally in addition to freezing Pell and has the most significant cuts in the history of the Department of Education since it was created. A third of all of the cuts come from the Department of Education. In a world that has been transformed by technology, in which the boundaries of mankind have been largely erased in the pursuit of human capital, where in fact someone does an engineer's report in India and transmits it back to the United States, or reads a radiologist's report in Ireland and transmits it back to a doctor in some hospital, or if you had a problem with your credit card, you probably ended up with a call center in South Africa. In a country and a world in which technology has transformed the boundaries of mankind in pursuit of human intellect, for the nation to be able to continue to be competitive and be the global leader, it needs to be at the apex of that curve of intellect. And so that means a robust and effective 
education system one that creates opportunity for each and every one of our citizens and that's what i intend to fight for in the budget committee as we mark up later this week to try to make sure that we change the direction of what our priorities are and what our values are and it's that same type of attitude from my experiences that led me to cast a vote that i think was very important even though it was highly criticized at the time that i cast it you know votes on war and peace are also votes about life and death and i have a standard i am not willing to send my son and daughter if the conflict is not right i am willing to send my son and daughter if the conflict is right and if i'm willing to send my son and daughter then i am willing to send your sons and daughters but if i'm not willing to send my son and daughter i'm not willing to send anyone else's son and daughter and in that respect and in that respect i was willing to send alicia and bob uh if it was necessary to afghanistan that's where osama bin laden was that's where al qaeda was that's where the taliban gave them sanctuary that's where the perpetrators of september 11th were those are the people who killed 700 new jerseyans and 3000 americans and that was the right cause and that was the right use of american force and then when we had the most sophisticated army in the world the most technologically advanced army in the world and we had osama bin laden uh, cornered in the hills of tora bora difficult terrain but nonetheless we knew that he was there we handed over to the warlords uh, stacks of money expecting them to hand he would they would hand him over to us and instead he escaped they took the money and we are now uh, still in search of the mastermind of the people who killed 3000 people in the united states and what did we do we deviated our attention to another part of the world and i'll tell you something i sat in the intelligence room and i read documents that were available to members of congress and i didn't see any clear and present danger to the united states i didn't see any imminent threat to the united states and i have to be honest with you desires of weapons of mass destruction but evidence of weapons of mass destruction no and so i made a decision that it was wrong to vote for the war in iraq and i voted no even in a district that lost 150 people of those 700 new jerseyans because i felt in my heart it was the right thing to do at the time i was criticized today as we are on the cusp of civil war uh, in iraq the very same people who came to criticize me to their credit have come to tell me you were right and i tell you these stories because all of us in public service and for those young people in the institute and all of you in your lives in which you may not be in an elected or even an appointed office uh although many of you are but even in the councils of the boardrooms of america which i often look around and see no one sitting in from our community uh the question is will you stand up for what you believe in will you stand up for what you know in your heart is right even though it may not be popular even though it may not be easy the course of human history has been changed by men and women who are willing to stand up for what is right even though it is not easy and that is what i ultimately think is the essence of leadership and that's why i salute all of you who have come to this luncheon year after year i hope that in your lives each and every day you will choose to find within yourself in whatever walk of life and whatever work you do there is always a moment to stand up for what is right and the question is will you choose that moment seize it and make life better for everyone else i choose to do that and that's why i'm willing to fight for my seat in the united states senate thank you very much for having me today. Senator, I expect 
you will see many of us again this evening at the Latino Leaders for Menendez reception on Capitol Hill to help ensure that you are elected to a full six-year term in November. <laughs> now, let me just mention that if, if we missed any of you in terms of an invitation to the event tonight, <laughs> we do have invitations uh, at the material tables as you exit. We ask you to, to take a look at that. This will be at the Phoenix Park Hotel on Capitol Hill at 6 p.m. The next Latino Leaders Luncheon Series will be held on Wednesday, June 14th. We have a wonderful keynote speaker, Senator Leticia Vandepute of San Antonio, the first Hispanic ever to serve as president-elect of the National Conference of State Legislatures. A final announcement, and then I'm going to ask uh, Bob to come forward so we can make a presentation. One week from today, at the Four Seasons Hotel, 6 p.m., an advanced screening of HBO Films' new project, Walkout. A wonderful film, a true story of the walkout of Chicano students in East Los Angeles, five high schools in all, including a young Antonio Villarigosa. A story that is told as a result of the production of Moctezuma Esparza and also the direction of Edward James Olmos. We will have them both, along with most of the cast with us, again a week from today. We'd like you all to be there and to bring a guest. We have invitations for walkout, again at the material table as you exit. Please take one and RSVP as soon as possible because seating is limited. Again, I'd like the Senator to come up. We have a, another addition to our Latino Leaders Luncheon Series for 2006, Senator Menendez. We'd just like to make this presentation of the Nambe Eagle Leadership Award from New Mexico. <laughs> Again, we want to thank Senator Bob Menendez for his leadership to our sponsors, the Coca-Cola Company, as well as Verizon Communications, to Harris Entertainment for the reception, to all of you for attending. I also want to thank my team. One of the, I mentioned to some of you that I saw at our fifth year anniversary uh, last month that the joy that I have received in building a business, I, I couldn't have anticipated the joy of assembling a team that I am so proud of, young Hispanic professionals that have an opportunity in Washington, D.C. to fight for our community and for clients that need our help. In particular, I want to thank Enrique Cortez, who is the event manager for the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. Again, my Enrique is right here. <laughs> On my left, I have Michelle Minguez. I have uh, Norelli, Norelli Garcia, David Ramirez, and Christian Sanchez. Thank you very much for being here.